Good evening, sir. Sir, can, uh, can you hear us? Ashish, you need to register your presence. But me? You, you there? Oh, I, we can, I can see. I can see you there now. Okay. Yes, good, sir. good, good. Finally, good. finally. But we are, unfortunately, we have done the whole thing in the uh, I, uh, iPhone. We, I should have done it on the um, um, uh, computer. Okay. Then we can see each other and other participants too, perhaps. Yeah. Right, right, mm. right, 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 right. Uh, anyway, now it, we have connected okay. at least. All okay. right. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank so you. I, thank I you. think I should start now. Yes. Mm. Uh, so, on behalf of Allahabad University Psychology Alumni Association, I welcome all the participants onto this special session. I especially thank Professor Ashish Nandi to, to be able to spare some time for us to share his valuable thoughts with us. Uh, I'm sure this session is going to be a very stimulating one. I want to put in a word of appreciation for the Chittamanthan Club. Why? Because Chittamanthan Club was a club started by, uh, started on the initiation of some of the uh, students of Allahabad University Psychology Department. Then they were able to connect others also. I would like them to introduce themselves. And I then hand over this, hand over the mic to Ms. Bhavini Tiwari to say something about the Chitmanthan Club because this session is on the, uh, the, the, the result of the efforts of the Chitmanthan Club. So we are also there, but uh, please Bhavini, please tell us something about the club. Thank you so much for your words, ma'am. Uh, good evening to everyone present here. My name is Bhavani Tiwari. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm going to be your moderator for this evening. We are extremely thankful to our speaker for taking out the time and energy today to give us his insights on the topic as Gandhi resigns from India. Mr. Ashish Nandi is a political psychologist, social theorist, and critic. Our session today has been made possible by Club Chitmanthan and Allahabad University Psychology Alumni Association. Chitmanthan is a student-initiated club uh, with a core community of passionate psychology students of the Department of Psychology, University of Allahabad, who work to offer the students a platform to interact outside the classroom and develop an interest and inclination towards the field of psychology. The club operates with the motto, connect, communicate, and collaborate. Our vision is to build an atmosphere that facilitates peer learning and helps students in their academic and non-academic pursuits so that they can put in practice the knowledge and uh, the knowledge obtained in classes and divulge relevant work to society. Ashka session Shuru Kanesapele, I'd like to inform you all. Ki ek interactive session hai, so up ne saval ya comments ko sir ke presentation ke baat ke le bacha ke rakhe, or bole jane par ya to raise hand click kare ya fir unhe chat box me type kar de. Or yez hand rakhe ki aap apne aapko meeting ke reach me mute rakhe. Now I would like to extend a warm welcome to Professor Asi Tripathi and invite him to introduce our esteemed speaker for the day. Thank you, Bhavani. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the Alumni Association of, uh, Psychology Alumni Association of Labad University. And uh, all those who have joined us today, I can see Professor Girishwar Mishra, and uh, I can, of course, see Professor Janak Pandey, uh, Dr. Manju Agrawal, and there's so many of you who have joined from, from uh, different places. So welcome to this very special lecture, which uh, Chathmanthan Club is organizing in collaboration with the AUSI Alumni Association. Um, I don't think there's any need to introduce uh, someone like Professor Ashish Nandi to you or to this group of people. Hindi mein kaha jaye to be kisi parichay ke mohtaz nahi hai. Ye mein isli keh raha hoon ki अगर आप साइकोलॉजी में हैं और अगर आप हिंदुस्तान में रहते हैं एंड इफ यू आर लिटरेट 
uh, you must have come across some of the writings of Professor Ashish Tandi, and if you have not, to shayad ye kehne mein mushkil hoga ki aap literate hain. Ye mein isliye bhi keh raha hu ki shayad aap sabhi jante hain that he is one of the most recognized public intellectuals in India. And all, all of us psychologists are very proud of him for one very simple reason, and that reason is that he's the only one among psychologists who can be called a public intellectual. From the, I think the kind of awards which he has uh, won. Um, I don't know how many of you really know that uh, he shares a Fukuoka prize with someone like Akira Kurosawa. You must have seen some of his films. Recently, he won a Hans Killian award and that's awarded to somebody who's distinguished himself as a great scholar. Uh, somebody who's distinguished as a great humanist also. Um, I don't think that it will be an exaggeration if I were to say that uh, uh, Sheesh is uh, our Sigmund Freud. Uh, I say that because like Freud, who wrote about civilization and its discontent, uh, he's been writing about uh, what he feels happened to be the discontent of the Indian society. Um, be it uh, colonialism, be it nationalism, the range of topics which he has written on are just tremendous, you know. It's a range which really is mind boggling. It's mind boggling in the sense that if he writes about psychoanalysis and if he writes about Freud, he also writes about cricket. You know, that is something which I think may surprise some of you. Um, he's written about films. So he's a critic. He's been a critic of nationalism, he's been a critic of uh, colonialism, he's been a critic of authoritarianism. So there is a lot which we can learn from him about how things are. And one of his favorite subject on which he's going to speak is Gandhi. You know that he has written a lot on violence. Uh, I think the, the link which was sent out uh, mentioned that uh, his interest in violence and genocide. Um, and today he's going to talk about something which is very, very dear to all of us. This being the month of January um, about Gandhi. Uh, so thank you, Bhavani. And uh, on behalf of uh, all of us today, Ashish, we want to thank you. It's a privilege to have you with us today. And we're looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. Invite you to speak. Hmm. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Ramaprasad, for your very kind remarks. I'm touched. And I thank you all for bearing with us because of this 
technical hitch it was because the i i didn't really look carefully into it otherwise i would have told uh, you that, that is professor trivakti party to send me also the link through the uh, google um, uh, gmail then i would have at the screen with me and larger screen with me and i could have seen the face of some of you better but that doesn't matter we are here concerned with ideas uh not with only the um, uh, visibility and invisibility of things though we will come to that also to some extent uh, i have decided to speak extempore here and not read out the paper i wanted to read out the reason is simply this uh, that some of the things i want to say should be very clearly stated i want to make clear some of my pet beliefs which i think has a different kind of standing from the way we often look at things first and foremost is the fact that for a psychologist of any hue <clears throat> the past present and the future are not separable all past to a psychologist is a part of the present because we con we conjure the past we we'll analyze the past we interpret the past and that past is not the past which our forefathers lived that past is the past of our creation and we apply to that to such studies of past whether we call it history or with be that kid call it memory the fact of the matter is this that indian civilization has a very large proportion of it which is inaccessible to the textual it always depends upon your memory for example our memories always at me sometimes all uh, very consistently i should say stand against our history in fact there is this uh, lines in the poetry of aga said ali uh, aga said uh, whatever uh, aga uh, this kashmiri poet who says that your history stands against my memory i don't remember the exact love words i just i'm uh, conveying the idea your history stands against my memory and your history stands against my history too and that multiplicity of history is not something which conventional historians take into account because history also is a psychological construct it is in our minds and we defined what is history at the present moment so the past for a psychologist is not separable from the present it merges into the present similarly with the future when we talk of the future psychologists that is of all hues all hues we are faced with a situation where the future is imagined this this is not the way future will unfold we are pretty sure of it nonetheless we construe the history, uh, the future as a way as a way of guiding our actions in the present that may be correct but in some cases it might go awfully wrong i remember a 
survey was done at the time of the pa uh, Paris Expo 100 years ago in the year 1900, if I yes. And some of the world's greatest scientists in that survey were interviewed as what they saw as the future of science. To give one or two examples, the discoverer of com uh, certain forms of communications, including radio, Marconi believed that the radio will never be something pop popular and private. Only a few will have access to it and few centralized radios will operate in, in the next century. He, he was disproved this within 20 years. What would be the highest speed attainable by human beings? One of the other questions asked. The highest estimate from the scientists was 250 miles an hour. That figure was crossed in the first World War itself by some of the planes used then. Within something like, you can say, 30 years. Actually, they already broke the sound barrier in the late 19th century, and late 20th century, sorry, late 20th century. Unimaginable at the time of 19, year, on the year 1900. So, there is no, no guarantee that future will, future will depend on our predictions or our anticipations or our, as consequences of our action. Future has an, will have some autonomy of its own. And we should be prepared for that. So even the future is located in the present in that sense. And a psychologist has to be always aware of that. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that Indian civilization is one of the very few where a substantial section or substantial part of the civilization depends only on memory, not on written text. Nobody can learn classical Indian Hindustani music or classical Carnatic music for that matter without the knowledge transmitted to them through their gurus directly. No textbook can play that role as it does in the case of science, the sciences, social sciences, and even humanities. You have to depend on a face-to-face -face training and a face-to-face -face encounter with your trainer, your guru, and what have you. So in this kind of civilization, also the mind plays a very important role. What people think, what people believe are crucial. And we cannot depend entirely on textuality. Um, we have to think a little bit more independently of our favorite disciplines, whatever they are. Not only psychology, but history, for instance, uh, or, or for that matter, political science. So this is one thing I want to make clear. <clears throat> now, 
I have proposed that I will speak on Gandhi. And I also want to make clear that for me now, Gandhi comes or appears in three forms. Before I go further, I let me spell out the, uh, my first exposure to Gandhi. I, I, I was born up. Uh, um, I was brought up in Calcutta at the time when the reigning god in the intellectual world was Marx, not Freud. Freud was occasionally mentioned. That's how it all. All. And we were, we learned from our colleagues and our friends, and sometimes our teachers too, that Gandhi was a kind of a superfluous uh, and to some extent uh, retrograde thinker and activist. And we had learned to have a certain kind of a, uh, uh, let me put it this politely as a, uh, it's not, it was not despise. It, it was a dismissal of some kind uh, of a person who was not considered intellectually alert and theoretically naive and ultimately an enemy of progress. My parents were both ardent admirers of Gandhi. That is another reason why I perhaps had, uh, had a kind of a negative view of Gandhi too for many years. I began to have a different kind of idea of Gandhi when I began to read him. First of all, I was very surprised by his English. I found it very elegant and very contemporary. Later on, I found out when I reread Jawaharlal Nehru's Discovery of India and Autobiography that Nehru, whose style we so admired, was not as, it was somehow has aged, his English has aged. Whereas Gandhi's English still seemed to make perfect sense and perfect, you know, looked perfectly elegant. And I found out the reason soon that it had a biblical simplicity to it. He and he wrote with a certain kind of conviction and passion, which also I like, began to like. I also find out that Gandhi was not as illiterate as Vinayak Damodar Savarkar thought he was. Savarkar had three, three accusations against Gandhi. The first was that Gandhi was superstitious because he believed in things like soul force in public life and political battles. Secondly, he found Gandhi politically naive and anti-scientific because he thought that fasting and non-cooperation and to total non-violence will win India freedom. Three, Gandhi was illiterate, uh, particularly in politics, because he has not read the modern political texts on uh, modern texts on political and political science. And I found out that actually he did not really read any of the modern texts on uh, textbooks on political science, he, even contemporaries like Harold Lasky and others, 
but he he was very well read in dissenting scholars of europe hmm. and it is that which powered his ideas and action this was this seemed to me very strange and i was i found, I found it even stranger when he said that his three intellectual gurus were leo tolstoy with his whom he was in correspondence and whom he carefully read to um andy david thoreau the um am americans satyagrahi you could call him satyagrahi before gandhi and three raskin all three were western all three were dissenters all three were con con um, uh, committed to non violence all three believed in uh, the, 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 deliberately inviting uh, the wrath the hostility of mainstream academic writings that's other part uh, for the first time i began to have a different concept of gandhi and then so i have relearned to view gandhi more as a friend who has taught me how to think about some of the crucial issues of our time independently of only the textual but also in terms of what the great thinkers of our time often tried to say or could not say and particularly the dissenting thinkers of our time yeah. so this is the other part of the story that and uh, and i discovered in the process of this rediscovery that that there are three gandhis involved three kinds of gandhis involved this might sound very strange to you there was the gandhi we all know which we can read and which we can remember and we can, we can respect or hate the gandhi of gandhi as he lived this life uh, and and he, he lived it very in a very public life you know even in the matter of not only uh, his beliefs but also uh, in matters of his sexual experiment however much nirmal kanma was was hostile to that that this, this shouldn't uh, this shouldn't go public gandhi was insisted that he would be he must announce every act of his it must should be open to the public uh, as judgment so, so that <coughs> uh, this is the gandhi on which there is can be controversy there can be hostility and ultimately one of his uh, um, former disciples nathuram godse killed him we know that Gatuna Gotse was a part of non-cooperation movement of Gandhi, and ultimately he killed Gandhi. Hmm. No. But I will that I can for the moment I will leave. Everybody knows the story. But there was another Gandhi. Actually, I had thought of talking only about that Gandhi today, which few know and few hear of. i will now go a little bit on that but before that i want to say the third kind of gandhi that um, that after gandhi's emergence in the indian political firmament 
people found their own Gandhis all over the world. In Italy, they called Daniel Del Dolci a, a, a uh, man working with the slum dwellers and the poorest of the poor in Italy, our Gandhi, the Italian Gandhi. People called the head of the solidarity movement, whose name at the moment I forget, our Polish Gandhi. They called Be uh, Aquino, I think his name is pronounced as the uh, later prime minister of uh, Philippines, I think, uh, our Filipino Gandhi, and so on. Wherever people found a bit the semblance of a, um, a touch of Gandhi, they identified it with Gandhi. Yeah. And in 1980s, when the scientists wrote a um, um, public wrote out a public statement on what science can or cannot do for world peace, the only person they referred to by name was Gandhi, the so-called anti-science uh, um, uh, retrograde uh, conservative. And the first Gandhi, I now come back to that, and I will take more time to that, for that, because that is a more recent discovery of mine, and that also is not my really discover discovery. I picked it up uh, from my, uh, one my late friend, uh, Sichir Kumar Das, who was a professor of comparative literature in Delhi University for many years. He's dead now who discovered, rediscovered, I should say, a book, small book in Bengali, by one writer, quite a respected writer, but not a great writer, uh, Pramothanath Bishan, written in 1945, five years after the death of Rabindranath Tagore. It is called Rabindra Sahitya. I can follow this Bengali. Please try to follow this. It is easy. Rabindra Sahitya Gandhi Choritre Purvavash. And that essay came to my aid. Because Pramotan Antibishi claims, I claim, and the document is very powerfully that much before Gandhi entered the scene, either in India or in South Africa, Tagore, in some of his poems, actually in 13 poems of a book called Noibeddo, as well as in two plays written in the last decade of the 20th, not 20th, sorry, last decades of 19th century, 1890s, 1880s, 90s, uh, have given vivid pictures of a new kind of a hero who resembled Gandhi. Hmm. Not only that, when Tagore wrote a long poem, a very well-known poem, on Guru Gobind Singh, the scholar and warrior saint of Sikhism and Guru, Actually, it doesn't follow the story of Guru Gobind Singh. And he gradually he is reformulated 
Tagore unknowingly reformed him into another Gandhi. Now Tagore also didn't know Gandhi. When he was writing this um, um, plays, he didn't even know that Gandhi existed. When he wrote, wrote uh, 13 poems in the book Noibaddo, each one inviting and anticipating the emergence of a Gandhi character in India. The austerity, the ability to directly deal with the poorest of the poor and the lowest of the low. And the sense of liberation it would bring to India. He thought about that. This also requires a longish footnote. First, the British, after the winning the Battle of Plassey in eight, uh, 1757, have now 100 years after the event, we are feeling more self-confident because they have also broken the Sepoy mutiny. Also won the mutiny, but have managed to suppress the Sepoy mutiny. They had a new sense of power, new sense of permanence in India. And even we are talking of remodeling Indian society and culture after the Enlightenment values of Europe, which they considered made them a superior community or superior race, if I might say so, to the, compared to the, what Indians were. They looked at um, their attitude towards Africa was, as we all know, that it was populated by people, half children, half, half savage, half savage, half child. And that's, uh, uh, that's Cecil Rhodes. It's not mine. Huh? And their concept of India and China was that these are, are ancient civilizations which had much to contribute to humankind at that time, but they are now tired old civilizations who need to be refurbished and remodeled by the vigorous new uh, civilizations that Europe was born, particularly after the introduction of enlightenment, enlightenment, enlightenment values. Because enlightenment values by that time has spread into the middle class culture too. So unless and unless, until we look at that picture, we will not know why, uh, for instance, Macaulay's minutes, took um, probably more than 50 years to be actualized in the field of education and why for the first time the British were talking of modernizing India. They even gave up supporting the uh, uh, the um, the what um, the uh, evangelical uh, program of the Christian churches because they thought they were interfering with religious things and they will uh, re-trigger something like a uh, Sepoy mutiny um, again by the way, doing that. And in any case, the priests were thought to be backward, conservative and anti-science. So that's the way it began. Uh, and in some sense, they, and now they began to openly say that they were looking to the future of, in, taking care of the future of India, which it was implied will be the same as the present of Europe. That dream, that vision has stayed with us 
till today. And Tagore's work for the first time used ideas taken from, I would say, the dissenting voices in Indian society to build this vision. It is not that he accidentally came into a vision of India led by a person like Gandhi. He actually borrowed some of it. Into his poetic vision of the emergence of Gandhi as the future liberator of India. Hmm. I'm calling him Gandhi. Tagore had different names. In the place, the name was Dhananjaya. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Uh, now, um, when. Uh, uh, now, this, this capacity to envision has now been brought within cultural, cultural anthropology and on a, in, within a new model, which borrows also from Freud's Book work on dreams of envisioning, seeing the base of visioning, not not seeing visions as some kind of a romantic or otherwise uh, uh, irrational dreaming, daydreaming, but this visions as simultaneously having uh, have the qualities of what Freud used to call deem, uh, sorry, dream ego. Uh, so there is a ego functioning, rational functioning, even dreams also. And what we think is a worthless, irrational imagination portrayed in dreams. He was studied by Gananath Obesekere in his new masterpiece, published only a half a dozen years ago, um, as something which, which explains a huge range of visionaries from Gautama Buddha to Robert Blake the English poet. And the visions which seemed inaccessible to a science built only on the concept of positivist concept of rationality uh, and, and, uh, and, and experimentation and so on and so forth uh, is an enormous breakthrough. For the first time, the, the great visionaries and their visions, however crazy that they might have seemed at the, some, at the beginning or some, to some moderns for that matter, was more accessible to those who are concerned with human mind and its workings. I strongly recommend uh, this book uh, to you, The Awakened Ones. This, uh, he has done the job of an entire generation. Always again, he's a Sri Lanka scholar, and, and uh, for many years he taught um, uh, at Princeton University. Now he is in Sri Lanka, retired. Um, which is a marvelous exercise, and he, uh, I taking the clue from that. I would have, I would, if I had, I would. would think of this vision of Tagore as not only a poetic imagination, but has which had deeper roots. 
and I have shown in my paper that these deeper roots are from three sources mainly. First, they depend on draw upon Buddhism, particularly in the matter of social justice and equality, and though Buddhism has already become by that time by that time extinct in India, so to speak, it underlay our thought and our feelings as a subliminal stratum of Indic civilization. And Tagore's use of Buddhism for venturing the cause, for fighting for the cause of social justice and equality comes mainly from that. He was the first Indian to make that use of Buddhism. Yeah. Is very, uh, it's a very fascinating exercise. Uh, and it's very one learns a lot from that. Uh, that that Buddhism comes back in a indirect fashion, and in without people being very conscious of it, as a, a force which can be used against this new concept of progress, uh, which also justifies the domination of the British because they have something to teach to um, teach to the Indians uh, the belief that it is a white man's burden to um, uh, to um, uh, to teach Indians how to run states how how to be educated in modern sciences how to be uh, uh, use uh, 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 modern philosophy and so on and so forth um, this is, is bypasses uh, this tract you know, altogether. Um, though Pedagor himself was a very well read person, he could have, but he didn't. He, it mainly came from Buddhism. Secondly, almost as important, it was the, the Middle Ages of India from which came the Bhakti movement and the Sufi movement. They kind of a part of the same movement in the Bhakti and Sufi movement, you can call them. Uh, <clears throat> this is also very interesting because following English education and its teachings, Indians had begun to use medieval age as a dark ages of India because Europe, it was the dark ages. So they transferred the epithet to India and Indian Middle Ages is in as dark ages. Whereas anybody seriously interested in Indian culture and civilization have to, at some stage or other, admit that the Middle Ages were not dark ages for us. It was a new enlightenment for us where there were these great names, great visionaries, great thinkers, great philosophers who came out of this Bhakti movement um, and gave India a culture which Tagore believed supersedes, Tagore believed, expressed the belief, supersedes the culture of the Vedas and Upanishads. This is controversial, but I, uh, this is what it happened. Now, this is uh, uh, also um, uh, must have been very painful for Tagore to some to some extent, it is because he was a Brahmo, a reformist sect, which reform tried to re reform Hindu Hinduism in terms of be the Vedas and Upanishads. So he, to some extent softened his commitment to that reform movement and be, be, took a new view of India's past, where the Indian present Indian culture and especially his integrative capacities, his capacities to cut across religious caste and uh, language barriers, 
came in the Middle Ages with people like Kabir, Baba Farid, and so on. So we know all of the names, well-known names, and so on, so forth. Lalan in Eastern India, and so on, so forth. Now, this, it was also the golden age of, India, of, of Indian music. That, that's when uh, Khayal was born, part of the rudiments of Khayal was born, I should say. Drupad was already there. But anyway, so it is that culture, medieval culture, which shapes India's integrative potentialities. Our national anthem comes from that, basically. Uh, Shock him, whom the doll Mughal Mughal put an act a holy. That's in our Janaganamono. By the way, Janaganamono is not the only national anthem Tagore wrote. He is the only instance in human history who wrote the national anthem of two nations and also tuned them India and Bangladesh. But many people do not know that he, one of his disciples and admirers wrote the national anthem of Sri Lanka and Tagore was associated with giving it some musical form. So he, is three, he had to do with three national anthems. <laughs> he was not a nationalist. He, he despised and hated nationalism. He was a patriot, all right, but not a nationalist. I be, distinguish between these two terms. And this, this distinction now made very clear that people like Tagore and to some extent Gandhi also, though he used the term nationalism, basically he had in mind patriotism. Patriotism is given to everybody, it's biologically given. Even cats and dogs are patriotic to the locality. It is territoriality of some form. That is what, uh, uh, the, what the biologists call that territoriality. Birds have it. And we also all. Are, are born patriots, so to speak, or humankind. So, but when you say nationalism, it becomes a different thing. For psychologically, patriotism is a sentiment which is given to us biologically, like the message carrying birds, pigeons, male, and so on and so forth. Like the cats and the dogs. I mean, if you change your home, the dog may be difficult to go with you, but the cat will never go. It will stay up in the old house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, so that patriotism was sacrificed for the sake of the Scottish nationalism. But the problem, nationalism is not a sentiment. It is an ideology. And like all ideologies, it not only guides you on demands um, from you, patriots of a different kind, but it also gives you a list of enemies and allies. So you have to align your feelings with the enemies and the allies of the regime, the state. Uh, and nationalism is a kind of a becomes a new binding cement, no, do not as powerful as patriotism to uh, all nation states. They don't forget that nation state was one of the uh, things which in uh, all ba all uh, back Asia African societies we had to learn. All Asia African society had to be uh, learned because only that form of state can give you European-style government with the military might to protect this independence. And this was the saying of Sabarkar, I am quoting from him. So Tagore always hated nationalism and his small book of nationalism, which consists of a lecture he gave to Japan and to China, is, is a good example of his position. And our national poet was all, always uh, um, despised nationalism. He found it uh, uh, not suited to India's civilization needs. 
patriotism is okay. He, he wrote hundred, not one or two, not only the national anthems of three countries, but he also wrote at least 150, more than 150 uh, patriotic songs. People sang his songs when going out uh, to offer satyagraha or, or when facing uh, British bullets. But, but it was not nationalism. He was talking about his patriotism. Okay. And the third source where the marginalized and the semi half forgotten bottom of the uh, social society of India, that the new visionary, vision, the envisioned liberator, the new liberator of India who will come, will not only be in touch with the poorest of the poor and the most marginalized and forgotten sector of the society, but also give them a new, grant them a new dignity and new power to actualize themselves. And these three sources, Buddhism, the Bhakti movement, and the re re recovery of the self and dignity of the bottom level of the society, from where Tagore's descent comes, not only of the available knowledge of India, but also from what was the ax axiom, if you like, you can use the term assumption of British colonial rule that it will civilize India. It is a civilizing mission of India that Tagore believed that in, in India has as much right to civilize um, uh, Europe as Europe has on India. I mean, <laughs> if you can read his, if you read his last book, uh, Crisis of Civilization, you will find exactly what I'm saying. That, that book brings Tagore very close to Gandhi. By that time, Gandhi has emerged in India uh, and they had met. And become friends, and despite many people uh, um, spending uh, late nights on studying the exchange between the two and dis dis discussing how different the two were, actually uh, they always remained dependent on each other. Tagore wanted to leave Shantaniketan, did want to leave left uh, to Gandhi and he wanted Gandhi to take care of it, uh, even though they, are, they, they differed on many things. Uh, but the friendship remained till the end. And uh, so in when, but what I'm saying, I also want to point out to you that it was not also only Tagore's vision. Tagore's vision has come from the Indic civilization is past, is present at that time, and is an anticipated future. Uh, or, 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 uh, so in some way, the, it was already subverting the dominant official future of India. It was trying to uh, equip us with a different concept of the future, where India is a more autonomous entity in deciding what is, is going to be its future. I, this is a long digression I wanted to give you because this is the way the first Gandhi emerged. The first Gandhi, the Pramutana Bishis Gandhi, or take, I should call it Tagore's Gandhi, was also not only Tagore's because that came, by the way, I forgot to tell you that Tagore had been traveling heavily in those last decade of um, the decades of the uh, 19th century and the first decades of the 19th century. And uh, because two of his children and his wife died in this term and, and, and they prematurely um, that. And he was very disoriented as moving all over India, uh, I would say absolutely obsessively. And 
his ideas also came from that uh, rediscovery of the high mark poly the personal discovery of uh, what india was and talking with many other communities and sects and um, um, uh, idea systems and so on, uh, so on to so uh, all i am trying to say is this that it was also the india which demanded a kind of a gandhi and pomotanat bhi actually appropriately com compares it to the uh, uh, fact that before ramayan was written up people worship ram in any case there are much evidence that worship of ram and worship of krishna both were prior to the first time that uh, the raman was written or krishna dayapan was written um, or our bhagavad was written uh, uh, so in some sense that was also an imagination which was hanging not on textuality but in the minds of people i think that is the india which poses us enormous challenge today yeah. it this challenge has become even more dangerous because this is what i wanted to start with but i will end with it that now to talk of gandhi in positive terms is a betrayal of indian civilization not civilization indian nation state and it shows the treacherous face of those intellectuals and thinkers who do not agree and have a dissenting point of view on that not only that it also stalls development and india's progress we have been deeply impressed south asia has been deeply impressed by the examples of east asia and southeast asia all of which which progress very quickly and dramatically in the last 40 years even thailand a small country like thailand has 23 times the average in, uh, income of an india uh, of india i had this had it out some years ago i it is no little old, old data hmm? so so somehow or other catching up with them taking their model of growth we all all societies in south asia no all societies so say each society, each of the countries in south asia wanted to repeat the success story of southeast asia and south asia and if you look uh, also in fact they, let me put it this way that they were called they were all called asian tigers hmm then they were <coughs> uh unfortunately i am sad when telling you this that all the tigers turned out to be manitas each and every country we tried to hasten their uh, development and uh, 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 quickly turned authoritarian and gave up whatever semblance of democracy their culture had or their such their uh, own constitution allowed even that was lost all of them became the uh, uh, authoritarian states and that has now began to infiltrate south asia sri lanka sri lanka was the first sri lanka was seen as the most successful south asian state not only because its um, um, development was healthy and robust but also because their uh, welfare system was excellent people talk is to talk about sri lanka having leapfrogged out of 
साउथ एशिया और थर्ड वर्ल्ड इन टू द सेकेंड वर्ल्ड बट इन द प्रोसेस ऑफ क्विक एनिंग द प्रोसेस ऑफ डेवलपमेंट एंड फॉलोइंग द रिकॉर्ड ऑफ ईस्ट एशिया एंड साउथ ईस्ट एशिया श्रीलंका डिवाइडेड इस एथनिक कम्युनिटी सो बैडली एंड बाई रिलीजन वॉर बिटवीन तमिल्स डिस्टर्स बिन तमिल्स एंड श्रीलंकन्स सिंगालास टू के नेस्ट फॉर्म and ultimately we ended in a long down war today sri lanka is not even bet what it was when it embarked the war its development some estimates say has been uh, thwarted by at least 30 years but it is only the first example that success story has now tried to cripple it to in india you see a touch of that such for the, uh, the, the australian scholar herb freed who first identified this particular syndrome calls it repressive developmental regimes they develop very well and very quickly but in the meanwhile they also turn authoritarian and repressive so i have come at the end of the story to where probably i should have started but i hope i have given you a scope because each of this same thing stay crisis i think also in its turn release new en- energies in the society and new forms of dissent more im- uh, imagine and more imagination and get a innovative thought and i do believe that ultimately indian civilization will triumph over that i have recently come across a book which was published some years ago but i it recently this a book on uh, written by a scholar on africa he, he calls it the black man's burden as opposed to the white man's burden and he says that africa's tragedy is this that it has tried to copy the nation state system of europe so in the process they have lost something of not only in the, on the front of development in the front of development in you know developmental front but also in the cultural front they have lost something of their own and they have not acquired a, a real access to uh, the kind of Uh, the uh, uh, liberation they sought their liberation has been fake from liberation from colonialism didn't take take them very far and we all know this from, from other sources also so here is a my talk is ultimately at, at attempt to find new forms of looking at india's future in the present as a part of our our rediscovery of ourselves and i leave the this thoughts with you hoping that at least some of them you will find worthwhile if not all thank you very much for your patience thank you sir that was uh, very enlightening and we thank you for uh, coming to us and speaking about all this